Thank you, Senator Collins, for that uh, thoughtful statement. And, and uh, I'm sure whether it's at this particular meeting, appropriations or, or others, you'll be watching out for the budgets of NIH, DHS, and uh, others that may be recipients on the panel. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's your record, I know. Um, our first two witnesses, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, uh, really a, a, a national hero, at least a hero of mine, uh, and I'm sure others, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH. I really appreciate that you're here today, and uh, we look forward to your testimony now. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Senator Collins, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the NIH mission of performing biomedical research for the purpose of preparing for and responding to naturally emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases and the relationship of this type of research to biological security. As you mentioned in your statement, the issue at hand is the ongoing threat of the emergence of an H5N1 pandemic influenza and the research that was supported by the NIH to address this threat. The conduct and publication of the results of such research in the form of the two manuscripts that you mentioned has focused considerable public attention on the issue of dual-use research namely research that is directed at providing new information critical to the public health, but at the same time has the potential for male malevolent applications. My written testimony is submitted for the record, and in my few minutes of time, I will highlight just a few important aspects of this issue. First, the public health challenge. Seasonal influenza is an ongoing threat to public health worldwide and is among the leading global causes of death due to infectious diseases. Each year, influenza causes more than 200,000 hospitalizations and up to 49,000 deaths in the United States and up to a half a million deaths globally. Yet influenza has animal reservoirs, especially in birds, and these viruses can undergo extensive genetic changes and jump species, resulting in an influenza virus to which humans are highly vulnerable. Such an event can, and historically has, led to global disasters, such as the one you mentioned, the prime example being the 1918 global influenza pandemic that killed up to 100 million people worldwide and caused enormous social and economic disruption. There is a clear and present danger that we will have another pandemic, since these viruses continue to circulate in the world and are constantly evolving towards pandemic capability as we have seen in 1957, 68, and 2009. Over the last decade, a highly pathogenic H5N1 influenza has emerged among chickens. Rarely, the virus spreads to humans. Since 2003, approximately 600 confirmed cases have occurred in humans in more than a dozen countries shown in red on this poster. Nearly 60% of those reported cases have resulted in death. Should the virus mutate to transmit more efficiently to and among people, a widespread influenza pandemic could ensue. Indeed, nature itself is the most dangerous bioterrorist. And even as we meet today, H5N1 and other influenza viruses are naturally mutating and changing with the potential of a catastrophic pandemic. This is not a theoretical danger. It is a real danger. For decades, NIH has supported basic influenza research included on transmissibility, host adaptation, and virulence. The goal is to anticipate what the virus is continually trying to do on its own in the wild and to prepare for it. Such goals were pursued by the NIH-funded scientists Kawaioka and Fouché and could have important positive implications for pandemic influenza prediction prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Kawaioka and Fouché constructed variants of H5N1 avian influenza in order to identify which genetic mutations might alter the transmissibility of the virus. In their studies, they employed a standard influenza animal model, namely the ferret. This slide shows the basic design of the experiments in which the virus was modified to allow for aerosol transmission from one ferret to another. I might point out that one of the causes of the public misunderstanding was the widespread belief that the virus that was transmitted by aerosol from one ferret to another actually killed the ferrets. 
when in fact that was not the case. We feel that these studies provide critical information and it was important to determine if H5N1 virus that has this enhanced transmissibility would remain sensitive to existing anti-influenza drugs and vaccines. In addition, and importantly, knowledge of the genetic mutations that facilitate transmission may be critical for global surveillance of emerging influenza viruses. Yet, since transmissibility of a virulence virus was increased, this constitutes dual-use research of concern, or DERC, which is shown on this poster. If a particular research experiment is identified as DERC, that designation does not necessarily mean that such research should not be published, nor should it should even be prohibited in the first place. However, it does call for us, as you mentioned, to balance carefully the benefit of the research to the public health, the biosafety and biosecurity conditions under which the research is conducted, and the potential risk that the knowledge gained from such research might fall into the hands of those with ill intent. In this regard, the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, or NSABB, was asked to advise the United States government on the publication of these manuscripts. You will hear in detail from Dr. Keim, the chair of that group, about the board's deliberations. Importantly, the public attention and concern generated by this issue has triggered a voluntary moratorium or pause on this type of research on the part of the influenza research community, as well as a fresh look at how the U.S. government handles DERC as manifested by a formalization of a government-wide policy to address the issue. This policy, which was released on March 29th, strengthens and formalizes ongoing efforts in DERC oversight and is described in my written testimony. The ultimate goal of the NIH in its embrace of this new policy is to ensure that the conduct and communication of research in this area remain transparent and open at the same time as the risk-benefit ratio of such research clearly tips towards benefiting society. The public, which has a stake in the risks as well as in the benefits of such research, deserves a rational and transparent explanation of how these decisions are made. The upcoming dialogue related to this policy certainly will be informative and hopefully productive in its goal of benefiting the public with the fruits of such research while ameliorating the associated risks. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Fauci. That was an excellent introduction uh, to uh, the topic, and I look forward to uh, asking you, uh, you some questions.